The title of this message is called All of Us Together. The Lord wants to say something t- today to his church because the battle is fierce and heating up. Y'all agree with that? If we don't have all of us working together, we will lose ground and the enemy can overcome us. I'm speaking to all of us today, but I'm especially speaking to the men. God has a message for you today. Some of you are holding back. Some of you are letting your wives be the spiritual ones. You're not leading your families in prayer and the word. Children need to see their fathers pray. They need that example of a godly man in the home. They need to hear dad reading the Bible to them. Thank God for godly women. Thank God for for you mothers that, that read the Bible to your children and pray over them every day. But we need the men to step up and do their part. There's a whole lot of young boys that need an example of a godly man in this world today. Christianity is not just a religion for women. It is men and women working and walking together in this world, being the example that the world needs to see. And if you haven't noticed, masculinity is being attacked big time in our society. It seems like it's eroded on every level. The devil wants to destroy families. He hates God's creation and he wants to stop the next generation from even being born. Who would have thought in our day, in our age, in a so-called civilized society that women would be fighting to murder their children? Who would have thought that? The devil wants to destroy families. We can stop his assault. We can stand up to his advances. But it is going to take all of us together. Not just one or two. Not just five or ten people praying on a Tuesday night. And praise God for the people who come out. But we need to fill up that chapel. It holds 200 people over there. Now, I know that some of you have jobs. Some of you are working. Some of you can't be there. But I think we can round up at least 100 people to be over there on Tuesday night. What are you doing on Tuesday night? Watching TV, probably trying to relax after a hard day at work. And I understand that. But we cannot afford in this day and age to be slack, can we? I want to give you the example of Deborah and Barak in Judges 4, 1 through 7. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor. Now, that's what happens when people do evil. He sells them into the hands of their enemies. We don't want that to happen to us. The captain of the host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Libadoth, she judged Israel at that time, and she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun, and I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. Now Deborah was a wife. 
She was also a prophetess and a judge. She called Barak and gave him the word of the Lord. She told him to assemble an army. And Barak listened to her. He didn't have to listen to her. This was a woman telling a man what to do. He could have said, I'm not going to listen to a woman. But he knew she had the word of the Lord in her mouth. And so he listened to her. Judges 4, 8, 9. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. He said he wasn't going without her. And she said, I will surely go with thee. She agreed to go with him. Notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, if Barak was prideful, he would have said, well, I'm not going to go into battle because I'm not going to get the glory for it, for the victory. Because Deborah told me that a woman's going to get the honor for for the victory. But he didn't do that. He went. He took the army, which only he could do. He was the one that was the leader of the army. Deborah wasn't. Barak was. But she was the one giving directions to Barak. And she said she would go with him. She proceeded to tell him that he would not be the main one honored for the victory, but a woman would be. And he went anyway, to his credit. Let's go on with the story. Judges 4, 16 through 18 and verse 21. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Heresheth of the Gentiles. And all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle which was a blanket, more or less. Then Jael Heber's wife took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Now, Barak was the one that defeated the army of Sisera, but Jael was the one who captured the leader. They both could take credit for what happened, really. The scripture portrays the working together of men and women to accomplish the will of God. Deborah, who was a woman, declared the word of the Lord. Barak, a man, carried out what only he could do as leader of the army of Israel. The men of the army of Israel went into battle to defeat the enemy army which only they could do. And Jael, who was a woman, did her part to gain victory over the leader of the enemy army. They all did what they were called and chosen to do. Let's look at the New Testament for a minute. Aquila and Priscilla. Acts 18, 1 through 3. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius, who was the emperor, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. Because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So they were a couple that Paul found to be able to to live with for a while and to make tents. Remember, Paul said that he, he uh, didn't want to take his, his livelihood from the believers. He wanted to support himself, and so that's what he did. He was a tent maker, and he stayed with them for a while. 
And they were the ones who in Acts 18, 24 through 26, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So he didn't know about Jesus being the Messiah and Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla had heard him, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So here's a couple, man and woman, together ministering and teaching Apollos the way of the Lord and talking to him about Jesus, who he did not no, had done what he had done and did not understand. And he listened to them. Now, Aquila and Priscilla were a husband and wife team whom the Apostle Paul stayed with for a while. Apollos was one whom they took under their wing and were able to teach him about Jesus being the Messiah and Savior of the world. God chooses both men and women to do his work. In Galatians 3, 26 through 29, it says this. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, what does this scripture mean? It means what it says. In the church, God calls both men and women to be his disciples. Isn't that right? And there are no specific men's roles or women's roles in the church. In the home, yes. In the church, no. It is man's traditions that have put restrictions on people. They say a woman can't preach in the church when there's men and women together. Women can only speak to other women and to children. You ever heard that? Some denominations teach that. So what am I doing up here today, right? What are we doing having Pastor Joanna be our pastor? Because it's God's choice. He's not looking at whether I'm a man or whether I'm a woman. All the gifts and ministry offices are open to all if they meet God's requirements. And that's the thing right there, meeting God's requirements. It is God's choice who he uses, and God is no respecter of persons. Now, I remember the day God called me to preach. I wasn't even going to this church at the time. Dennis and I were taking care of the grounds down at the uh, church that used to be called Church of the Good Shepherd. Down the street, it became Valley Worship Center. We were living in an RV in the back of the church. Seems like we're always living in the back of a church <laughs> most of our lives. But anyway, in that, in that time, it was an RV with two little kids. And our job at the church there was to go around and check all the doors at night, make sure they were all locked, make sure everything was in order. Sometimes Dennis would go there and do that. Sometimes I would. He'd stay with the two little girls that we had. It wasn't very far, but it was kind of, in a way, it was dark. It could have been scary. But, but you know, God met me in that church in those dark hours. And they used to have what they call a mourner's bench in some churches. It's a it's a long bench thing and you come and you kneel and 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 uh see god at it methodist churches are famous for those but anyway they had one at the church of the shepherd 
And so sometimes I would just kneel down there in the dark by myself, 10, 11 o'clock at night, and be praying over the huge sanctuary. It was probably about as big as this is over there. And I remember very clearly one night that the presence of God rolled in. I mean, you all know when the presence of God rolls in and he touches you. And very clearly he spoke to me, I have called you to preach my word. And I said, God, do you know what you're asking me, a woman, to be a preacher? And I knew it wasn't just to women and children, although I've done a lot of that. But I knew it was to whoever would listen to me. Well, you know, God knew that. He knew all the ins and outs. And that was probably about 40 years ago. And back then, it was a lot harder for women to be preachers. Praise God, we've had some pioneers out there. Cindy Jacobs and Joyce Meyer and some other people that have um, Barbara Wentrobel, who was just here recently who have paved the way for us. So it's not quite the stigma it used to be, but they went through a lot of persecution to do what they did. Amen. But God is no respecter of persons. And he's called us. He called Pastor Joanna to be pastor of this church. Yes. And it wasn't just because she was... Pastor Jim Benita's daughter either. God saw the hours she was spending in worship. He saw the prayers that she was putting forth night and day for this church. Even before she had a position here. She spent 11 years in the prayer ministry here before she came, became pastor. Sometimes she'd be back behind the curtain when we had a curtain still here, praying for the service by herself. Claustrophobic back there it was, but she was back there. Nobody knew it. She didn't announce to the church, hey, I'm back here praying for you. She just did it. Why did God choose her to be pastor? Because he saw, and he's still seeing the things she's doing that none of us know anything about, the prayers that she's putting forth for you all the time. God didn't choose her because She was his second choice because no man would accept this position. You know, I've heard some women say that. Well, I have this position because God called a man that wouldn't obey him. So I'm, I'm here. No, no, you're not. You're here because God chose you first. He saw your heart. He saw what you were doing. Anybody that has a heart after God, it says in due time, God will exalt you. Amen. Most of the people that have gone on and we've sent off to ministry in other places have been born out of the prayer ministry here in this church. I remember the nights that Pastor Joanna and I spent over there doing midnight prayers, sometimes in this building, sometimes over there, sometimes at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, day after day, year after year. That's why this church is still here, not because of us, but because of the faithful people that came Amen. and supported what we were doing. But God wants all of you to be involved. And I'm going to say this, you know, 
There's a group of intercessors that we call intercessors at the church. But all of us are called to prayer. All of us are called to be prayer warriors. All of us are called to intercede for, for things from time to time. And you can stay at home and pray, yes, you can. And you need to have that one-on-one -on -one with God because that's where we develop the intimacy that we have with him. But you don't get the exponential power until you come together. Now, Mio and I are about ready to ramp this thing up here. She's worship pastor. I'm in charge of prayer and intercession right now. And we're going to ramp it up. And we're going to ramp it up pretty fast. Because that's what God wants to do. He wants to merge the prayer and the worship together. And he doesn't want it just to be us. He wants it to be everybody. Because he has a plan. And it's not just to sit here as we are. He wants us to influence this valley. And if we're going to influence this valley, then we've got to come together. So what is God calling us to do? To honor one another, to respect one another, to recognize one another's talents and ministry gifts. We as women need to Look at our husbands, look at the men in this church and realize what callings they have, what giftings they have. And men, you need, need to do the same thing with your wives. You think I could do what I'm doing without the support of my husband? No, I couldn't. But he's a great support to me. Hallelujah. Neither could Pastor Joanna do what she does without Jeff's support. Now, she came to me one time before she took over the prayer ministry, and she had a dream she wanted to share with me. I don't think she'll mind me sharing it with you. Because God gave me the interpretation for it. But she said, Debbie, I had a dream. And in this dream, I was walking on the road, and I was picking up all kinds of needles and nails in my feet. And they were hurting. And I didn't know what to do about it. So I went to Jeff, and he sat me down, and he took my feet, and he started pulling the nails out of my feet. And she said, what do you think that means? And I told her, I said, it's because Jeff is going to be a support to you in this. And he's going to be there, and he's going to have your back. And whatever you go through, he's going to be there to pull those nails, so to speak, those, those trials, those thorns, those things that people say to you that may be ugly and not nice. And believe me, she's dealt with people like that. Some of them are not here anymore because they didn't want to sit under a woman pastor. But Jeff has been very supportive to do that for her. She couldn't do this job without him. Could you, Joanna? She couldn't. So we need to recognize one another's talents and ministry gifts. We need to help one another achieve one's destiny. Be thankful if your husband or your wife has a gift that you recognize. Allow him or her to go for it, to develop it, because it's God that gives those gifts, and his gifts and calling are without repentance. We need to work together as the body of Christ, Je Jesus being our head. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 18 says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, 
and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. Who am I to argue with God for what position or what place he's chosen somebody to be in? It's his choice. We are all members set in the body of Christ as it pleases God according to his will. Just as I've been born into a certain family in a certain nation with a certain personality and appearance, so I have been destined to become what God has created me to be. It's God's choice, not mine. There's so much confusion today in this world about what God has chosen people to be. They don't even know if they're a man or a woman anymore. And let me tell you, there's not 52 genders. There's two. You're either a man or a woman, and it's what you were born to be. Accept it and run with it and let God put you in the destiny that he's chosen for you to be in. God said he created in the beginning man and woman, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. So the devil's lied to people, hasn't he? And he's still lying to them. Why is he lying? Because he hates God. And he hates you. Just realize that. God hates you. And he's going to lie to you. And if you'll believe his lie, then he will destroy you with it. God's destiny is not like the career that you can decide what you want to be and to do. I can't just decide. It's God's choosing. Your destiny has been decided for you by your creator. And you will never be satisfied until you say yes to his call and his choosing. Some of you need to do that today. You need to stop fighting against God, what he created you to be. And say, yes, God, I am going to do your will. So where are the prayer warriors today? They're all sitting out here. Are you silent or are you praying? Where are the apostles? Where are the prophets? Where are the preachers? Where are the pastors and teachers? Where are the servants of the Lord? There's, you're out there. You're out there sitting on a calling. I know you are. I know some of you are called today to do these things, and you're not doing them. You're sitting there, coming every Sunday and being spoon-fed and getting fat and not willing to pass this stuff on to other people. If we don't wake up as a church, we are going to lose our country, our society. We've allowed the world for too long to take this stuff from us. And just coming and being entertained week after week after week, listening to the word and not doing it, saying, I don't have time. You have time to do what you want to do. And the prophets and the preachers and the prayer warriors are not just women, they're men. And some of you men are doing that in this church. I know there's a men's prayer meeting. I know there's a men's class. I know, but there's not enough of you. Most of the work here is being done by women. And we're getting clobbered, guys. Pastor Joanna just spent two days in the hospital. I spent two weeks in pain 
with a sciatic nerve problem. That's when the Lord gave me this message. I worked through the pain and put the message down because I felt so strongly about it. Mia was in a car accident about two months ago. Could have been killed. She's our worship pastor. We need you guys to cover our back. We need you to pray. And it's not just throwing up, okay, God bless them. Amen, I'm out doing my own thing. We need some exponential power. When Mel Tari was here, he said that we were going to see exponential power. Well, you don't get exponential power in anything, in miracles. Which is what we want to see. In salvations, which is what we want to see. Without exponential time in prayer together. This place is not just a nice location to come to and enjoy the music and listen to a good sermon. It's a training ground for spiritual war. And I'm calling you all today to enlist. Well, actually, if you're a Christian, you're already enlisted. You just need to, you just need to get on the ground with your boots and begin to fight the enemy. And the enemy is not people. The enemy is principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness. And we know that, but we, we don't act like we know it because we're always fighting with each other, with other people. Or You're going to win the battle in prayer. You're going to win it. God's given us the weapons. Most of them are lying dormant. Some are sitting back and letting others be on the front lines without any defense. How many of you guys would let a bunch of women go to the front lines in a war and get shot at and you're standing in the back doing nothing? You wouldn't. Just think of it. This is spiritual war. God needs all of us to care for one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Colossians 3, 12 through 15. I wanted to read this in the NIV because it's a lot clearer. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, God, for your word today. Lord, I pray, Father, that everyone that listened would take this to heart. Father, we're not living in the same decade that our grandparents lived in. We're living now in a very dangerous time. Lord, I pray that you would help us to obey your word. You know, I want to invite everyone to come today who just needs to make a fresh commitment and say, God, I'm making a stand today that I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. Some of you are sitting on calling. Some of you are sitting on giftings. Some of you have tremendous gifts that we don't know anything about because you've never really used them for the Lord. But God wants you to say yes to him today. He wants you to say that I'm willing 
God to be used, no matter if it's scary, no matter where you take me. You know, God's not just going to throw you into a pit of wolves without preparation. <laughs> he leads you step by step by step. When God called me to preach, he didn't set me right away in front of a group of people. I, I began with small groups. I began with children. That's the way God does things. So don't be afraid of what he's asking you to do. Some of you he may put in a position very quickly. We don't know how much time we have, do we? before Jesus comes back or this world blows apart. We just don't know. But God knows. And he knows what he's asked you to do. So I want to invite everyone right now to come forward and just say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to do what you want me to do. Thank you, Father.